All right. Well then let me, um, I'm gonna share our screen and we'll just, we'll get started with this. So um, I think I'll share my desktop and then I'm gonna put a website on the desktop. And this is what we were looking at last week. So this workshop is really just an introduction to the Buddhist scriptures and, and, and is intended to guide beginners in reading, reading the Buddhist scriptures. And, and the basis of, of doing this is this, uh, is this website, this very, very comprehensive website called Sutta Central, which has been around for about 10, 15 years now. And it has um, a complete translation of the Buddhist scriptures based on the Pali Canon. So this is the this is the version of the scriptures that writ is written in the ancient Indian language um, called Pali, and which has been handed down since probably a couple of centuries before Christ until today. Uh, and it's been preserved by a particular school of Buddhism called the Theravada. So last week I talked about all of that and gave some historical background, talked a little bit about the, the history of translating the Buddhist scriptures. And, and well, I'll stress again, like I did last week, that we're very fortunate to have this website. And there are a number of other websites and resources that now make the Buddhist canon, the entire collection of scriptures available in, in clear, plain English, um, and yet um, in translations that are also accurate. So I was just, last week we were just sort of orienting ourselves to, to this website, which lays out the organization of the scriptures. And the title of the workshop is The Three Baskets, and that is the, 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 that, that is the name, that's the popular name of the Buddhist canon. So you see up here, Tipitaka, the three baskets of the Buddhist canon, and the baskets are the collections, so the collections, so the canon, and a canon is, is an is a authoritative collection of scriptures, and so the scriptures are divided into these three baskets, these three divisions. There's the basket of discourses, and they're all they're all arranged at the top of the homepage of this website. There's the basket of discourses, the basket of monastic law, and then the basket of they call them systematic treatises, abhidharma. And that is that really are is a collection of texts that are really kind of, kind of analyzing the discourses of the Buddha. For our purposes, um, learning, learning, to, learning the scriptures, you're probably going to be most interested in the discourses of the Buddha or the talks of the Buddha. And these are all contained in the basket of discourses. There are several thousand of these discourses that are collected in this basket. Here you see, there are 8,202 English translations of discourses. So it's a huge, it's, it's a huge corpus of writings. And, but this is really probably the most interesting part of the canon for people who are wanting to learn about Buddhism and people who are practicing Buddhism. And so, you see that these discourses, so we've gone now, we've gone into the basket of discourses and you see that the discourses are then subdivided into five collections. Um, and let me just go back. Yes, the, the five collections, they're the long discourses, they're the middle discourses, courses are the linked, the numbered and the minor discourses. And we talked about these, these, these different collections last time a little bit and actually dipped into 
um, the number discourses just sort, sort of briefly. But what I would like to do today is, is talk, is kind of focus on the, the link discourses. And the reason for that is that I think that this is really probably a really good place to begin if you're unfamiliar with Buddhist scriptures. And the reason for that is that the linked discourses are, first of all, most of them are very short. And so they're kind of manageable and you can, you know, you don't kind of get lost in them. And, and the second reason is that the discourses in this collection are, are arranged according to topic. And so you're able to, if you're interested in a particular topic of Buddhism, then you can, you can usually find a chapter in the collection of linked, linked discourses of a, the Pali name is the Samyutta Nikaya that will contain several, in fact, perhaps even as many as a couple of dozen discourses on that particular topic. So that's kind of what I kind of wanted to, to um, look around in, in this collection today. And one of the reasons is because we want to look at a specific discourse that's contained in this collection, and that's the so-called first sermon, the first sermon. So um, traditionally held to believe the first discourse or the first talk that the Buddha gave after his enlightenment when he began teaching and, and disseminating his knowledge and his experience to others. So that's contained in the linked discourses. In fact, it comes at the very end of the, uh, at the end of the collection. So, so let's just, let's just look into this, uh, this collection and you see that, um, so once again, I'll go back just so you, you kind of don't get lost with my navigating here, but we've gone, we've gone, so here's the homepage. We've gone into the basket of discourses. We are looking at the collections of linked discourses. And then the top collection is the one in Pali, Samyutta Nikaya. The next one actually is this collection as it's found in the Chinese canon. So this is the Chinese version of the link discourses. And it actually um, is, is the version that was transmitted by a different school of Buddhism than the Theravada. So the Samyutta Nikaya is the Theravada version of the link discourses. And in the Chinese canon, we have the Sarvastivada version of the discourses. So this is another, another sect, another early sect of Buddhism that had its own, that, that transmitted its, its um, scriptures, trans, transmitted the, the, the teaching of the Buddha independently from um, the Theravada. And it's that collection of the Sarvastivada school that was translated into Chinese. So the collection of linked discourses in the Chinese uh, canon is slightly different from the link from the collection that we have in the Pali canon. But let's just stick with the Pali canon for now. So we've gone into the linked discourses, and here you see one, two. Whoops, sorry. Um, Here we go. We see one, two, three, four, five um, books. We could call them books of this collection. The Pali name is actually a Samyutta, but let's just call them books. So the link discourses are divided into five books. Okay. And you see already that they're, they're um, they're organized according to topics or also, um, also structure. For, so for example, there's a whole book of discourses that 
come with verses. So there is, so the Buddha first give us a talk and then he may, he may summarize his teaching, what he said in the talk in a couple of verses. Um, so one of, the, one of the benefits of this website is that it gives you a description of every one of the divisions of the, of the, of the scriptures. And, and so we can just read this description. It says the book with verses at the first of the five books of the linked discourses. It's divided into 11 samyutas or sections with a total of 271 suttas. These are uh, further subdivided and so forth. Um, and then going down a little bit, each of the suttas in this collection contains a verse with a prose narrative structure. Where most of the samyutta is organized around subject matter, here the organizational principle is people. Each samyutta contains a conversation involving the Buddha or his disciples with a different person or kind of person, such as gods, non kings, nuns, or brahmins. A typical sutta has a bare narrative structure where someone comes to the Buddha and utters a verse, and the Buddha replies with a better one. In some cases, notably the Saka Samyutta, the narrative element is developed into a lively exchange and so on. So we don't have to um, go any further than that into it, but you see that that's a whole style of discourse. And some of these discourses, some of these verses are actually- Lodge and window. Thomas interrupted recently. Yes. Okay. Shall I continue? And so these are, so that's, that's the group of linked discourses. And then we have discourses beginning with causation, discourses beginning with the aggregates, the six sense fields and the path. Okay, so all of these are concepts. So there are a number of, there, there were a number of occasions where the Buddha talked about causation, causation. So why was causation important for the Buddha? Well, because he thought that everything that exists and everything that occurs in nature is the result of certain conditions. Everything that exists depends on certain, comes into existence given certain conditions. And this idea relates to the whole, what's called the doctrine of impermanence. Everything is impermanent. Things don't, well, nothing lasts for every, ever. Everything is due to certain factors that um, give rise to it. And then eventually, because everything is dependent on certain conditions, um, it doesn't last forever, but it ceases to exist when those conditions are no longer um, satisfied. So there are a number of discourses about this a whole. And so if we click further into this, this um, samyutta, then we get discourses and we see how this is further broken down. We have discourses on ca ca causation, discourses on uh, comprehension. So this is like realization on the elements. So these are discourses on the nature of matter. Um, not sure what the, uh, the unknowable beginning are discourses relating to the origin of the process of transmigration, 20 discourses that speak of how the ultimate origin of the process of transmigration is unknowable. <laughs> we don't know how trans so transmigration, the cycle of rebirth is, is without beginning. We have discourses with Kasapa. Kasapa was one of the more um, famous and revered disciples of the Buddha. Sometimes, sometimes you see the Sanskrit name Kashyapa, Kashyapa, so Kasapa. And this is a collection of discourses that are just stories about this fellow Kasapa. Let's look at a couple of them. Um, here we have, so there here we have all these different anecdotes about this particular monk. Um, who was a very advanced monk, thought to be fully enlightened. So 
Here we'll just just read a very just read one of these. It's only it's only a couple of paragraphs. At Savati, monks, mendicants, Kasapa is content with any kind of robe and praises such contentment. He doesn't try to get hold of a robe in an, in an improper way. You know, what would that be? He'd go around asking people for one. That would be the improper way. So instead of just waiting for someone to give him the robe. He doesn't get upset if he doesn't get a robe. And if he does get a robe, he uses it untied, uninfatuated, not sure what that means, unattached. Oh, I see, he's not infatuated with it. He's not attached to it. He sees the drawback, he understands the escape. So he wears this robe without any attachments. And then it goes, and then it says the same, same thing about Kasapa is content with any kind of alms food. Okay, so in the Buddhist day, the monks would beg for their, their meals. They didn't prepare any of their own meals, but they, in the morning, they would get up and they would, um, if they were camped out on the outskirts of the village, they would go into the village or the town and want and, and go from house to house and beg. They had begging bowls and they would ask people to give them something to eat. And that's where they got their food. They only got, they only ate food that they received through begging. And so, Kasapa is content with any kind of alms food. So no matter what food gets put in his bowl, he's content with that. And then we have, remember, so we have now dot, 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 that indicates the repetition, right? So you just kind of, um, you adapt the first paragraph to this statement. He's content with any kind of alms food. He doesn't get upset if he, if he doesn't get any alms food. And if he does get alms food, he uses it without attachments, without any attachments, seeing the drawback. The drawback is the drawback of becoming, of taking pleasure in it, becoming attached to it, and so forth. And so it says this about lodging, about any kinds of medicines he's received. And then Buddha draws the conclusion so you should train like this. We will be content with any kind of rose, robe and praise such contentment. We won't try to get hold of a robe in an improper way. We won't get upset if we don't get a robe. And if we do get a robe, we'll use it untied, uninfatuated, unattached, seeing the drawback of this, the, the, the danger in this, this little possession that has been stowed upon us, if we become attached to it, and understand the escape, the escape from this danger, in other words. And so he, he says, he repeats this for all of the other items. So that's just one sutta um, about kasapa, kasapa. Let me read one other, and then we'll, we'll I'll give you a chance to have questions. But this is, a, there's another one about kasapa that I like especially. I can sort of relate to it myself. Um, old age. <laughs> <laughs> so I have heard uh, near Rajagaha in the Bible. So the, the Buddha was staying near Rajagaha, which was the capital of one of, one of the ancient kingdoms then, in the Bam bamboo grove, which, which was a, you know, a, a bamboo grove outside of the city where, the, where he would hang out with the monks. Then Venerable Mahakasapa went up to the Buddha and bowed and sat to one side. The Buddha said to him, you're old now, Kasapa. These worn out hempen rag robes must be a burden for you. So Kasapa, you should wear clothes given by householders, accept invitations for, for the meal and stay in my presence. And Kasapa answers, for a long time, sir, I've lived in the wilderness, eaten only alms food, worn rag robes and owned just three robes. And I've praised these things. I've been, I've been one of few wishes, content, secluded, aloof and energetic. And I praise these things. But seeing what benefit Kasapa have you practiced these things, sir, Seeing two benefits, I've long practiced these things. 
I see a happy life for myself in the present. Now notice this word, he says, this, this is a happy life. We'll get back to this a little bit. And I have compassion for future generations thinking, hopefully those who come after might follow my example. Or they may think, it seems that the awakened disciples of the Buddha for a long time lived in the wilderness, ate only, only alms food, wore rag robes, and owned just three robes, and they praised these things. They were a few wishes, content, secluded, aloof, and energetic, and they praised these things. And so they'll practice accordingly, which will be for their lasting welfare and happiness. Seeing these two benefits, I have practiced these things. And the Buddha says, good, good, Kasapa, you are acting for the welfare and happiness of the people, for the benefit, welfare, and happiness of gods and humans. So, Kasapa, wear worn out hemp and rag robes, walk for alms, and stay in the wilderness. So that's just this, this little dialogue between Buddha and Kasapa. And I wonder if you have any, any comments on that or any questions about that. Just, just speak up. Um, can people unmute themselves? I think so. Um, Oh, John? I feel like I have yes, who's, who's too speaking? much stuff now. I'm, who's speaking? Mike. Is... Mike. Mike. Okay, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, it kind of makes you feel guilty when you have all this stuff that you have now. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, um, we're, we're not monks. So a lot of, and a lot of these anecdotes, I mean, that's maybe one observation to make is that there are a lot of stories, you know, most of the stories with other people are dialogues between Buddha and his, and his followers, the monks. But there are, there are also, also many dialogues between the Buddha and lay people or people who are not his followers. There are, you know, there are first of all, um, followers of other teachers that he encounters. And and sometimes they, they approach the Buddha in a rather aggressive way, challenging him to ask what they think is some difficult question or disputing something that he teaches. So that's one kind of encounter he has. Um, but he also, then there are quite a few dialogues with the Brahmins, okay? Have you, have you heard of the Brahmins? So these were the priests of Hinduism. Well, of the form of Hinduism that existed at that time, you know, um, which was very focused on the Veda, this, this, this ancient um, collection of hymns that were sung and chanted at sacrifices. And, and they were, the Brahmins were um, suspicious and resentful of the Buddha in many ways because he made, you know, he, he, um, questioned a lot of their practice, especially the, the, the performance of sacrifices. And so you have qu quite a few encounters with, with, uh, between the Buddha and Brahmins, where the Brahmins are, act are challenging the Buddha and trying to discredit him in some way. And of course, the Buddha always wins these debates, um, but they're, they can be quite interesting. So that's another sort of um, engagement he has. They're also engagements with kings and on and on and on. And sometimes in many of these engagements, by the way, they, they end with the follower of the other sect or the Brahmins converting to become disciples of the Buddha. So there are many, many examples of this. And in fact, um, our next meeting will actually, one of the texts I wanna read will be the story of Angulimala, who actually was neither a Brahmin nor a follower of, of another sect, but who was, who was um, a highway robber, a thief. And um, <laughs> the story, and, and, and so the Buddha converts him and he becomes a follower of the Buddha. I have a question, John. Yes, Frank. Yes. Um... My understanding, 
when the Buddha came off, when he had his first enlightenment experience, he came by and talked to, I think, three or four people that he had been hanging out with before that. They were all yogis, from my understanding. And uh, they were doing practices, ascetic practices and all that. It, would those talks be the first ones when he came out of enlightenment? Would they be somewhere in here? Uh, that's 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 exactly what, what what I was about to talk about. Oh, so well, we're, we're connected there. <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you for that setup, and let's let's just move on. Let's um. Let me, I have one other question, John. John Denny, before. Denny has a question. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Finish, Frank, and then we'll go to. And one letter. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, where would I find the Satipana Sutra? In, in here is it in this sata central because i have the text i've been studying for a long time it's consider the direct path of enlightenment that the buddha had commented uh, and then there's yes, interpretation. That's called the, the foundations of mindfulness right and, um i think it's i think it's in the link to discourses but i'll have to i'll have to verify that but i'll locate it i'll locate it for us i, I think appreciate that so much i can't go right to it now and so who are Thank, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. So who's next? It's in the middle length courses. Anna, yes. Yes, go ahead. Um, it's in the middle length courses, the, the, what Frank asked. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, thank you. All right, anybody else? Amy. So I had a question here on the first line. Um, so I have heard. So it sounds like this is written in first person. And I'm curious as to that source, who's relating the conversation between uh, the Buddha and Kasapa. OK, um, so um, I mentioned this last week. And, and many, many of the suttas or, or sermons begin with this phrase, so I have heard. And so you're right, that, that indicates that someone is, is um, someone who was present on this occasion is relating this encounter or this, this dialogue to others. And this goes back to the way that that these sermons and talks were transmitted so they were in fact so according to tradition now you know some people don't really are, aren't really confident that these are the actual words of the buddha but according to tradition whenever the buddha gave a discourse you know a number of people were present and and they and they committed what he said to memory on the spot and then and then handed that down through an oral tradition until all of these servant sermons were compiled into a scriptural canon and so this statement is so i have heard usually this is attributed to a particular person ananda ananda who was like the personal secretary or attendant of the Buddha and was present on almost every occasion when Buddha delivered discourse. And so at a particular time after the passing of the Buddha, according to tradition, the whole community, the whole Sangha of his followers came together and they wanted to, to um, preserve his discourses. And so they asked people to stand up and recite discourses that they had heard the Buddha deliver. Well, most of them were recited by Ananda. And that's the beginning of the oral transmission of the discourses that eventually became the scriptures. So yes, this is the, so I have heard. So, so this is, in other words, this is a, this is a report. It's a report. And Buddha, the Buddha is referred to often in the third person, right? It's as, as he is here. And so it's not something the Buddha himself wrote. And he's not, he's not speaking in the first person, but the Buddha is referred to in the third person in many, many, many scriptures, almost all of them. 
Okay. Um, let's go back. Let's go back then to the linked discourses. We'll go back to the beginning. And so these are the, the, the five books of the linked discourses. And the fifth book is the linked discourses on the path. Okay, so you can imagine that there's a, a lot of practical, a, a, you know, a lot of information of, of practical value for people who are actually practicing some form of Buddhism in this particular book of, of the linked discourses. And so we have just uh, discourses on the Eightfold Path. Uh, here's mindfulness meditation, Satipatthana. And this is where you find the, um, this is where you find the foundations of mindfulness discourse. Um, and um, then we have discourses on the different senses. But they talked a lot about the senses different powers, psychic power. Here's another um, chapter that, that is just a collection of discourses with a particular, um, a particular follower who is famous for his powers of clairvoyance. Discourses on breath meditation. Um, and then finally we get at the very end. So this is the very end of the Samyutta Nikaya, discourses on the truths. And here we have in the second chapter of the Discourses on the Truth, we have rolling forth the wheel of Dhamma. And the first discourse in this section is titled Setting in Motion the Wheel of Dhamma. Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta. It literally means pushing the wheel, pushing the wheel of Dhamma. Um, so starting the teaching, the, the inception of the teaching, and according to tradition, this indeed was the first sermon of the Buddha that he delivered after his enlightenment. Okay, well, how do we know that? Where does this tradition come from? Well, in fact, I can't show this to you now, but elsewhere in the scriptures, there are here and there um, uh, biographies or sort of partial biographies of the Buddha that recount, recount in chronological order the events of his life. One of the most important of these biographies is actually in the book on, on discipline, in the Vinaya. It's in the second chapter or the second, I don't know, the second book of the Vinaya, I guess you'd call it. And it begins with a long account of the Buddha's awakening, and then um, the, first, the first stages of his teaching um, that then eventually led to the founding of the monastic order. And it's in the book on Vinaya because with the founding of the monastic order, then you had to, you had to devise all of the rules that the monks live by, and that's what discipline is. So we do have, in certain parts of the canon, we do have texts that are partially biographical. And it's in these texts, and in several places, um, these, these are the texts that attribute this particular sermon, um, that identify this particular sermon as the first one the Buddha, that the Buddha gave after his enlightenment. Okay? So let's read it. Let's read it. Uh, it's not too long. Um, so linked this linked discourses, um, Samyutta Nikaya 56.11. That's how it's usually cited. So once again, thus, thus have I heard, thus have I heard, starts in the same way. So this is being recited by Ananda prob probably. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Varanasi in the deer park of the Isipatana. Well, Varanasi is Varanasi. Var Varanasi is Benares, which of course is, um, is a city in modern India. So one of the, it's what was one of the ancient cities um, that existed already at the time of the Buddha. 
Yeah. There the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus of the group of five thus, okay? So there was a group of five bhikkhus. Now remember, bhikkhu just means a monk. And so these guys are referred to as bhikkhus because they became followers of the Buddha, they became monks. But actually this group, group of five were five, I don't know if friends is the right word, but companions of the Buddha during a period of his practice, of, of his um, spiritual practice, when he engaged in extreme ascetic practices. Okay, do you know the word asceticism? Asceticism, I actually have a little um, handout here. Um, so here we are, you know, just, just in that handout, maybe we can send this out later, but we're talking about the first sermon here, okay? And this is, and you would find, so how do you, how do, how do you navigate to it? Well, you start out with discourses on the homepage, you go to link discourses, discourses on the path, on the truths, rolling forth the wheel of Dhamma, setting in, in motion the wheel of Dhamma. But you can also just, yeah, I've given you the, the URL and you can just click on that and it'll take you right to this text. How do we know it's the first sermon of the Buddha? Well, we have a, a partial biography of the Buddha in the Vinaya Pitaka, as I was saying, in the chapter called the Kandika, the Kandika chapter. And in that chapter, um, the first subdivision of that chapter is, a, is called the Mahavaga, the going forth. And this is one of the most important narratives of the Buddha's life, beginning with his enlightenment. But uh, that focuses especially on his teaching and the formation of the, of the monastic community. And so, and in the section on that, in, in that uh, biography, section six is the account of the group of five. And that, that also presents a version of the same discourse that we're reading now. So these five characters, were companions with other Buddha when he was practicing asceticism. So asceticism is you probably heard this word, you know, severe self-discipline, renunciation of all forms of self-indulgence, um, even voluntarily subjecting oneself to pain and discomfort. So um, this is what yogis do. Yogis are sannyasis. You can see them in India today, people who are engaged in this kind of very severe kind of practice. And the Buddha thought at one particular time um, that this would be the way to Nirvana. This would be the way. And there were actually many other ascetics um, living at the same time who advocated this as the method to attain, to, to become released from the cycle of rebirth, to overcome suffer, to overcome suffering. So, and what's the theory? It's a kind of a very kind of I don't know, I want to say primitive sort of idea. And that is that, you know, what is it that, you know, that, that subjecting yourself voluntarily to suffering neutralizes karma. It neutralizes your karma. And that puts an end to the cycle of rebirth because you are reborn due to your karma. So if you are somehow able to eliminate your karma, then rebirth will stop for you. And so there were many people who practiced asceticism in that belief. And so in this, on this particular occasion, the Buddha practiced this for several years. He finally gave it up, realizing that this was not really the way to nirvana, and went off on his own, then discovered or sort of rediscovered a, a form of meditation that culminated in his enlightenment. And then after attaining enlightenment and kind of, I don't know, sort of um, marinating in that for several weeks, he decided that he would try to teach others the, um, 
the path that he had followed to enlightenment. Um, and so the first, who are, who are the first people he encounters to teach? It's these five guys that he had practiced asceticism with, who thought that he had given up, thought that he, that he wasn't tough enough to, to um, follow the, the, the ascetic life all the way to the end, to the goal. And so they considered him a failure. Well, here he runs into them again outside of Benares, um, close to this deer park. A deer park is probably a, either an animal, a animal refuge, or some, sometimes these parks were hunting reserves, royal hunting, hunting reserves. So he encounters them again, and he begins to teach them. And so this is what he says, bhikkhus. These two extremes should not be followed by one who has gone forth into homelessness. So someone who has left uh, the householder life and is one pointedly seeking liberation from rebirth. What to? The pursuit of sensual happiness and sensual pleasures, which is low, vulgar, the way of worldlings, ignoble, unbeneficial, and the pursuit of self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, and beneficial. Without veering towards either of these extremes, the Tathagata, okay, that's a title, that's a name he uses to refer to himself, has awakened to the middle way, which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, enlightenment, to Nibbana. Okay, so we encounter this word for the first time. Nibbana or nirvana is the Sanskrit spelling. Nibbana is Pali, nirvana is Sanskrit. So he, he, he begins by telling them that the right path is the path between the extremes of um, self-indulgence, the life of luxury and sensory indulgence, which he had lived um, supposedly as a prince. But also of the you know the other extreme of asceticism or ex this kind of extreme self mortification that he had been practicing with them, so he's essentially he's starting by telling them that they've been following the wrong path. That's what he's doing here, and then he says, "And what bhikkhus is that middle way, awakened to by the Tathagata, which give rise to?" Vision, dot, dot, vision, knowledge leads to peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, nibbana. It's this noble eightfold path. That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Okay, so we'll probably have time to look at most of these different limbs, the so-called limbs of the eightfold noble path. But some of them you can already recognize this right concentration. So there's different, um, two of them involve meditation. There's mindfulness. Mindfulness was a form of meditation that the, that the Buddha taught his, his disciples. But the concentration is um, like trance or deep meditation, samadhi. The word here is samadhi, actually. Uh, so concentration. But then you also have right speech, right action, right livelihood. So these, this is the this is essentially right conduct. So there are certain there are certain moral precepts that that um, you must follow in order to attain nirvana. Then we have right view, right into right view is basically um, um, not being confused about all kinds of needless things that you don't need to think about. But we'll get, we'll get back to some of this. So, so he says, what is the middle path? It's this noble eightfold path. And of course, the noble eightfold path becomes the foundation of Buddhist practice and the Buddhist Sangha. This is, this is practice. This was the practice that, that the Buddha um, sort of designed for his followers at the earliest time. And then he so having stated um, the Noble Eightfold Path, he launches right into these four truths that he says everyone must realize. 
This bhikkhus is the noble truth of suffering. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering, union with what's unpleasant is suffering, separation with what is pleasing or pleasant is suffering, not to get what one wants is suffering, in brief, the five aggregates of attachment, or the five aggregates subject to clinging or suffering. That's the first truth. So I'll, I'll go through all four and then we can go back and talk about them. Now this bhikkhus is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It is this craving which leads to renewed existence accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination, or sometimes usually that's translated as non-existence. So there are these three kinds of cravings that are the cause of suffering. Now, bhikkhus, this is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. It is the remainderless fading away and cessation of that same craving, the giving up and relinquishing of it, freedom from it, non-reliance on it. So the cessation of suffering um, is the result of eliminating desire or craving. Craving is usually, some, sometimes it's just translated as desire. And then finally, now this bhikkhus is the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. It's the noble eightfold path. And then he restates the noble way, you know, to what he said before, right view, right thought, right speech, and so forth. Um, so those are the, the four noble truths that um, many people, even, even at the earliest stage of Buddhism, was considered by many of the Buddhist followers to be the very essence of his teaching. This summarizes his message, these four truths. One is that everything is suffering. Second is that desire is the cause of suffering. The third is that it's possible to eliminate suffering completely by eliminating desire. And of course, the elimination, the complete elimination of suffering is removal from the cycle of rebirth. And that's nirvana or nibbana. And then the fourth is the way to eliminate desire. And that's, that's by following these practices uh, that, are, that are listed, that, uh, that are spelled out in the, in the Noble Eightfold Path. Okay. And then he says, now then it becomes kind of interesting, he says, um, now this, um, let's see, where are we here? Um, and then he kind of goes back over them. He says, this is the noble truth of suffering. Thus bhikkhus, um, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. This noble truth of suffering is to be fully understood. Thus, bhikkhus, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. This noble truth of suffering has been fully understood. There arose in me, again, vision, knowledge, true wisdom, and light. And he goes through the three other truths in exactly the same way. He, in other words, he um, sort of articulates how he um, comprehended each of the Four Noble tr Truths in three distinctly different ways. And so there's actually, there's, you know, and this is how the tradition analyzes it. There's actually a sequence of 12 distinct realizations in regard to the Four Noble Truths. And the Buddha kind of lays that out for us here. But anyway, he says, finally, um, so long bhikkhus as my knowledge and vision of these Four Noble Truths as they really are, in their three phases and 12 aspects was not thoroughly purified in this way. I did not claim to have, have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devas, Mara, and Brahma. In this generation with its ascetics and Brahmins, its devas and humans. 
But when my knowledge and vision of these Four Noble Truths, as they really are, in their three phases and 12 aspects was thoroughly purified in this way, then I claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devas and so on and so forth. Um, the knowledge and vision of when, and when I, when I realized that, in other words, when I fully understood these four noble truths, the knowledge and vision arose in me, unshakable is the liberation of my mind. This is my last, this is my last birth. Now there is no more renewed existence. So when he comprehended these four noble truths, he realized that he was fully awakened, fully enlightened, that his mind was liberated, and that um, it was that he had accomplished everything that was to be accomplished. That um, that he would not be born again. And so he, and, and to him, what that meant is that he would be released from suffering um, and so on. And then if we go on, there's just one last paragraph of this that I want to um, <clears throat> bring to your attention is that this is what the blessed one said, elated, the bhikkhus of the group of five delighted in the blessed one's statement. So they're convinced. Um, and while this discourse was being spoken, there arose in the venerable Kandanya, the dusty, stainless vision of the Dhamma. And he expresses this by saying, whatever is subject to origination is, is all subject to cessation. In other words, everything that comes into existence, passes away. So he has a vision of impermanence. Kondanya was one of the five ascetics. And so what this last paragraph is telling us is that just from hearing this, this um, discourse, one of the ascetics himself attains realization without practicing the whole noble eightfold path. Okay, so that, that this is then there, there are a few other elements to it that we won't don't have to read. You can go back and look at it yourselves. But this then is considered the first statement of his teaching. And so once again, we have these, we have these, um, go back and look at some of the, the, the teaching of suffering, everything, you know, and some of these are some things that, you know, a lot of you probably know about Buddhism. Every, you know, Buddha said everything is suffering. And here he kind of, he, you know, this is, he spells it out, the kind of the defining experiences of human existence are suffering, birth, aging, illness, death. Uh, you know, most people are willing to grant that at least aging, illness, and death are suffering. We may not know so much about birth, but um, I've heard that people who um, are able or who are able to be hypnotized. Some people have been hypnotized and re-experience their births. And they invariably report that it's extremely uncomfortable and frightening experience. Um, so these are kind of the defining experiences of life. Though Buddha says they're all suffering. Well, maybe, you know, that's plausible. And then he says, separating from what's pleasant is separation from what's pleasant is suffering. So even, even daily life is suffering. Not getting what you want is suffering. Okay, well, you know, it happens all the time. And then, but then he would say, he doesn't say it here, but he said, even, even getting what you do want is suffering. <laughs> because he thinks, he thinks that we're all suffering right now whether we realize it or not. In fact, there are other, some other discourses where he talks about how what we consider to be pleasure is actually suffering. It's just relatively less suffering from normal suffering. And so there's no true, no, the sensual pleasure, sensual pleasure does not deliver any true joy or happiness for the Buddha. Now there are other, it's not, there are other kinds of pleasure that 
we can cultivate it uh, in the course of practicing the path. And the Buddha talks about this. And remember, I remember I, I just wanted to, I drew to your attention that Kasapa, in this little in this little dialogue with Kasapa, where Kasapa says, you know, he's content with all these. He says, says I'm happy. I'm you know I'm I'm happy wearing these these uh, these old rags and just begging for my food and living in the forest. I'm, this is this is happiness. So it's not like the Buddha um, completely ruled out the possibility of happiness in this life, but he thought he didn't think that we could achieve it through in the usual way, in the way most of us think we're going to achieve it, and that is through the experience of, of sense pleasure. And, um, and then I'll just say, and, and so the, the Buddha, I mean, maybe I'll just sort of finish with this um, so, that, so that we have time for some discussion. The Buddha um, thought that, that this was a very difficult truth. This was the, of the four truths, the first truth of suffering is the most difficult to accept. And I think this is true. I think, you know, that, that most of us will, you know, are, will, you know, as soon as we, we'll run our eyes over this paragraph and think, eh, okay, so, you know, we won't, it sort of doesn't even come into question for, for most people. But the Buddha thought that it was essential to his teaching. And so there are many discourses where he comes back to this idea of suffering. And there are many ways where he tries to persuade his listeners that, um, Suffering is universal and inevitable. Um, but once again, at the same time, there is, you know, there is the possibility of happiness too. Yes, um, so go ahead. I had a question about this. Um, what I've been finding in a lot of more uh, current interpretations of the word dukkha, that, it, that most, they, they think that Buddha really meant dissatisfaction, not suffering. There is a difference between suffering and dissatisfaction. Basically, he's saying that that anything you do, you're really going to end up being dissatisfied. Just like with impermanence, it has that quality, that spin, is that you're going to do it for a while. You might like it for a while, like pleasures. You might like the pleasure. You might get a sense of joy, and pleasure, but eventually you're going to give it up. You're going to so oh, this isn't anything. This doesn't really do anything for me now you'll end up being dissatisfied with even the things that you find joy with. So that's why they question the because a lot of people when they say suffering, oh, well, it's not, life's not suffering all the time. You know, you have pleasures and yeah, but what happens to your pleasures eventually? You get disillusioned from them. They, you get tired of them, you get bored with them. Mm -hmm. So that's what he, they're questioning now that dukkha really means more like dissatisfaction than mm -hmm. suffering. Yeah. yeah. There, yeah, that's a good. It's a good point because indeed, there, you know, there is that interpretation, and in um, I, I, I actually think in the in the discourses themselves, the Buddha talks about different varieties of suffering or different degrees yes. of suffering. So there is, there is, you know, and certainly that is an aspect of suffering. So it's sort of just uh, just the idea that nothing. Um, no experience in this world is so satisfying that you can just say, oh, okay, um, you know, I don't need anything else, you know, um, or that that's enough for me. And, um, and um, you know, I'm, I'm content, you know, that just never happens. It's never, we're never completely, um, we're never completely satisfied. And so that's certainly an aspect of suffering, but there are other aspects to it too. And Buddha also talks about, you know, what, what we might call just active suffering. The, the, the word for it, the Pali word is dukkha dukkha. <laughs> so that's sort of, sort of that suffering here and now that's unmistakably suffering, like, like, like sickness, like death, like all of, you know, all of these, um, you know, these inevitable experiences. And so they're, they're actually, I think there are different dimensions to suffering uh, that um, you can talk about. Uh, another question.
You know, John, actually, I had a, a little comment more on context. Mm -hmm. um, first off, um, uh, sometimes we think like, oh, he happened across these, uh, the five um, mendicants. But, you know, what I would suggest is that he sought them out. In other words, he, uh, the Buddha actually became enlightened in Bodh Gaya, which is like 150 miles away from this. And like you said, he, he stewed for many weeks as, and he wondered, gosh, can I, is, is there any way to take or to give what I've learned and be able to present that, you know, to other people? And mm -hmm. I would argue that, or at least there's a possibility that he sought these, these five, the group of five out specifically with some sort of idea that says, hey, you know, we have a shared vocabulary, we have a shared experience. Mm -hmm. and if I can't, if I can't get through to these guys, it's unlikely that I'll get through to anybody. And so, like I said, he, he had to travel, I don't know, 150 miles just to find these folks. So I would, I would argue that he, he, he sought them out specifically and that he wouldn't have to, you know, explain every last uh, uh -huh. thing, you know, like you said, talk about becoming and non-becoming. These, these must be concepts that he had discussed with them, you know, over the six years that he, that he hung uh -huh. out with them. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I would, you know, realize that there's probably much in here that he wouldn't had to have had to explain, you know, like the eightfold path and the idea of sensual pleasure and the idea of becoming and non-becoming um, because that, you know, they, they must have discussed these, these uh, uh, kind of ideas in the six years that they hung out with each other. Because one of the things that, you know, interests me is like, nobody asked him a question. He's like, well, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? It's like, they, they just all took it like, oh yeah, yeah, I got it. You know, and then in that, the end, like I said, with Kondanya, like out of the blue, he goes, oh, this is impermanence. Like, you know, if you read the, the sutra, you go like, well, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, how, how is he talking about suffering? And then Kondanya comes up and says, oh, this is, this is impermanence. It's like, yeah. well, where did that come from? You yeah, know? no, that's, yeah, thank you. That's, that's, um, that's a great point. Oh, everything you said is really excellent. And I think that's quite plausible that he sought them out, you know, everything you said and that, that, that they, that um, they shared, shared a vocabulary so that he didn't have to explain everything to them from scratch. And, and yeah, no, ex excellent. And I also th think that this, you know, the kind of the different realization. So the Buddha, the Buddha is talking about his realization of the Four Noble Truths th th and that that culminated in his, in his enlightenment. Um, when he realized these Four Noble Truths, he realized that he was, that his mind was free and that he would not be born again. But there's a completely different content to Kondanya's realization. Uh, and his realization, essentially everything is permanent. And so what are these two what do these two realizations have to do with each other? That's a very interesting question. That's, that's a complex question and that's something, but this is the kind of question that comes up when you read the scriptures and it starts kind of the, the wheels turning and it makes you wanna read more and get more information. Well, where does the Buddha, where are the places in the, in the sutras where the Buddha talks about impermanence? And we're so. I mean, I would I would suggest you would go back to that section of the of the linked discourses on causation. You would look at the book on causation and the chapter on causation, and there you're going to find other discourses where he's talking about how everything is conditioned and so forth. But but this is a really yeah you know it's really kind of illustrates the richness. I would say the richness of the teaching where are the, there are these actually different ideas and they don't immediately harmonize. And so you have to, this is this kind of where your journey of self-study begins. When you notice these kinds of discrepancies, 
and you know that they must some there there must be some resolution somehow and that's what motivates you to continue reading how are we doing for time Hosen? Uh, let's see. Uh, it's currently uh, twelve twenty. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And what what do you propose? I'm 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 still, I'm just getting started myself. So, but but um, <laughs> but other people might have. You know, of course, you can always just sign out. But maybe you. I know you want to have a meditation at some point. Um, I would say. Let's see if there are more questions, John. Maybe give it another 10 minutes and then okay. after that, whoever would like to join me in meditation, please stay on. We'll be doing a 20 minute meditation program. And John, before we leave this also, if you could point us in the direction for our, um, the next meeting is not happening next week. And again, we'll be mm -hmm. sending out an email about that. It's gonna be happening in two weekends from- yeah this this weekend and i do have a question <laughs> or okay um go ahead and ask your question ask your question and then after that i'll um yeah just I'll... if you could say something you know where it says when it uses the word right but i don't think it's right versus wrong could you say something about that it's that's a good question too it's it's like so we have what are the what, everything every every um that's how you've never thought about that very much but every so here's here's the path up here right view right so every every limb of the path is preceded by the word right the 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 poly word is samyak so, so it's um which means more like correct correct it's so well, so why? So, correct. So, so there. In other words, there's a there's a certain. I get. I think that here's what I think the Buddha is saying. Is it applies with this word right? That there's a certain way um, to do these things, and um, and so it's important to do them in the correct way, so that you you so that they have the result that you're seeking and so so he is he does have a method he does have a method and he does say you know like when it comes to mindfulness you know well these are the things th these are the topics of mindfulness these are the th these are the things to be mindful of and so there's a there's a method and a procedure that, so that goes he goes into details and especially when it comes to conduct. And I would say when it comes to conduct, yeah, there is right conduct and there's wrong conduct. And so there's right speech, for example. You don't lie. Um, you, don't, um, uh, you don't speak frivolously. You don't, you don't, you know, you say things that are meaningful and um, relating to the Dharma and so forth that you, um, so there is such a thing as there's right speech, right, you know, right action means nonviolence. You don't harm other other living beings. So um, so, but when it comes to meditation, you know, then you know there's there's you know, there's a certain um, process or procedure that he imparted to his followers. Yes, uh, Michelle. Yes. Michelle. Or, or yes. Okay. Who's next? Uh, John, can I just say something? So, thank you for kind of clarifying this, because for you to say is a certain way, and um, Anna uh, just chatted wholesome or unwholesome or wise. Um, I like that because, right? I think maybe many people think right versus wrong. And to say that there's a certain way of doing these things takes that out of this duality. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Other questions? Wanna... 
All right, let me, um, let me, okay, Alexa. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about, um, this is maybe like a zoom, zooming out question a bit, but um, this, this notion of self-study of the, of the suttas, uh, I wonder if you could speak more to like, last, last week you talked about this almost being analogous to uh, the rise of, being able to have a private relationship with the Bible, like a non-mediated relationship um, in, in Christian traditions, right? Which is revolutionary in so many ways. And I wonder, um, yeah, it's sort of the relationality, like self-study seems maybe quite strange in the context of the tradition. And so I wonder how, um, how your understanding kind of locating a practice of self-study within kind of within all of that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, let me, you know, tell me if this helps. And that is that I think I I talked last week about, you know, I how I I I feel that reading Buddhist scriptures enriches your own practice, enriches your own practice. It's if you know, you will find your practice in the scriptures, and it, you will find it discussed. And in many ways, that will clarify your practice, what, what, you know, whatever you're engaged in. And that, for me, that's, that's strengthening, it's, it's strengthening. And I mean, one, um, I think, one benefit just from from reading the earliest the earliest scriptures is that it it becomes more real. It becomes more real, and you also kind of tap into a community. You tap tap into a teacher and a community of of um, practitioners who are who are doing it and are engaged in it, and so it's a it's a connection to this, um, you know, this this real phenomenon of of Buddhist practice, which is which the Buddhist talked about over and over. Does that help at all? Yeah, I I, I should say I'm I'm studying Pali right now, so I'm I'm I definitely agree with you on like the 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 beauty and the benefit of um, of engaging with these scriptures. Um, I think my question is mostly about like, what does it mean to do that as an individual and in a self, like in a self-study way, uh, as opposed to in a communal, like like this is a communal study group, right? Or, um, or with a teacher, right? Or in these other forms where, as you said last week, like kind of just encountering the scripture divorce from its context like online on the internet is is quite new for how oh. people might be you know like what does it mean to approach the text as an individual for self for self-study um where for so many centuries the, maybe the study has been more relational or communal or um that was that was more of my, along my question oh, i see yeah okay um um i think um that in order for um, the study to be communal and collective, you have to um, you have to study them on your own. So my my idea is that you know that a a study group consists of people who are reading the scriptures on their own and bringing to the group things that they discover and questions they have and they can share with each other, but. Um, I um, I think that um, the scriptures have always been there, and throughout the history of Buddhism, individuals have read them and interpreted them, and and shared ideas about them. So I don't I don't think that self study really is is really anything new. I think I think that it's always been part of Buddhism. Um, for people who have access to scriptures, especially for monks, and uh, who might know Pali. But I think, you know, maybe it is a new situation, because today we have 
were actually, we have these translations that actually give us access to them in sort of an unprecedented way. And, um, and so I guess that's my idea. I guess, I guess if you're going to, if you have a study group and this really isn't a study group, I, I didn't think of it so much as a study group. I thought of it as, as a, uh, an introduction to the scriptures so that you can begin to study them. And, um, but I think that part of studying the, the, the scriptures collectively is to read them individually. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, John, I have a comment on that if you'd indulge me. Mm -hmm. um, so actually you skipped, uh, I think a, a pretty important paragraph is, so when Kondanya goes, you know, oh, whatever is subject to origination is subject to cessation. You know, it's kind of out of the blue. And the very next paragraph is when all of the divas freak out and they go like, oh no, um, they, they've started something that can't be stopped. You know, that's that's actually in there a couple of times. And, um, and they, you know, the world quivers and shakes and the Brahmins and, mm -hmm. and all of them kind of freak out. Well, what are they freak? Why are they freaking out? And, it, and, you know, you have to say is like, oh, that people can figure this out on their own. If they're pointed in the right direction that, hey, you know, these people don't need us. You know, the Brahmins go, oh, they don't need us. Oh, the divas, oh, they don't need us. Mm -hmm. They can figure this out on their own. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, you know, to, you know, answer is, is self-study, you know, a viable option. You know, I think that's one of the lessons of this sutra is that you can, you know, uh, figure this out. So the, so the wheel of Dhamma, uh, you know, you didn't kind of, uh, kind of talk about what, what this might mean, but, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if it's a takeoff of, the term hitochaka, which is the wheel of reason, Dinyaga in, I don't know, the four or 500 AD came up with this thing called the wheel of um, the wheel of reason. And it seems to me this wheel of Dhamma is kind of the same thing that you can actually, that there, there is an element of reasoning to enlightenment. You know, sometimes in the Zen tradition, we think, oh, it's all experience and, you know, sit and meditate. But um, uh, you know, one of the things that always kind of stuck in my mind is when Sasaki Roshi goes, oh, I want you, you know, in uh, Sanzen, and you go, oh, I want you to go back to the, uh, uh, back to uh, uh, the Zendo and think about this. And I go, what? You know, we're not, we're Zen students, we're not supposed to think about this. But, but the argument is, with this wheel of Dhamma, wheel of reason, is that there is an element of reasoning uh, on the path to understanding. Yeah. And, and self-study is part of that path. Yeah, I mean, excellent, excellent. I, I, think, um, I think in this last paragraph, I think the, the question is, you know, why are the, the devas freaking out? <laughs> what's what's happening you know what do they mean by it's it's been the, the wheel of dharma has been set in motion and it can't be stopped now you know what what exactly you know what do they mean what do they mean what you know why why are they saying that and so again i think that that you know i think your suggestion is plausible and um but i, th I you know i i think I'm not sure what I'm not sure what they mean by that, but I think that's plausible. Um, the wheel of Dhamma is a reference to the um, wheel of victory that kings in ancient India would would roll in front of their armies. These huge wooden wheels that um, that were pushed ahead of the army. Um, as they um, as they invaded other territories and and um, went on a war uh, went on a campaign of conquest um, 
conquering other and, and subjugating other kingdoms. And so the wheel of Dhamma is the, the wheel that the, the Buddha role. So it sort of, it symbolizes victory. It symbolizes this, um, you know, this um, huge event of converting and changing the world and bringing everything under the influence of the, of the Dharma. And so that's usually, that's usually how the wheel of Dharma is, is understood. Um, I think, but I think at that point, I, we should then just go back to Hosen and uh, maybe she wants, oh, I wanted to just alert you to the, um, the readings for next week. Okay. Um, and this is the Anatta Lakana Sutta. This is considered the second sermon. Also found in the Link discourses, Samyutta Nikaya. And I would suggest that you try here. Here is the standard reference to it, SN, Samyutta Nikaya 2259. See if you can locate it on your own. But if you can't, you can just go to the link and I'll ask Hosen to send this out to everybody so that you have this link. And then the second sutta we, we should look at, I think, we should then move on to another. Um, collection of discourses. Look, go go to the middle length discourses, and um, this is the Angulimala discourse. This is the one I mentioned briefly before, where Buddha converts a highway robber. I have a question, John. Mm -hmm. Where does the Heart Sutra come in? At what time does the Heart Sutra come in? <coughs> Um, the Heart Sutra is um, a later scripture that's not included in the Pali Canon. So it's, it's one of the Mahayana scriptures, oh. which, which, um, which evolved four or 500 years after the passing of the Buddha. So Heart Sutra is dated around first century AD, something like that, or even earlier. Okay, because I was reading a text, they call it the Heart Attack Sutra. And they were talking about how the devas and all the monks freaked out. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. During that time, and I was just curious what your comment, I'm sorry to bring it up at the end here, but I was just sitting on it for, for quite a while, wondering what you would, your take on that would be. Well, I mean, the Heart Sutra is considered one of the, the central uh, Mahayana Sutras. So it's one of sort of the definitive statements of the, the, the teaching of emptiness. I didn't realize it. Yeah, I didn't realize it wasn't in the Pali. Yeah. Hey, and thank you so much. It, I didn't. It's, chan it's chanted on a daily basis at, at Bodhi, Bodhi Manda. Right. Yeah, I think it's powerful. Yeah. Most powerful experiences I've ever had. Yeah. Thank you so much. Welcome. John, thank you so much for today. Yes, thank you. So and, and all of you participating today, some of you would like to join me. We'll take a five minute uh, break and we'll see you in the Sutra Hall for a 20 minute meditation program. Okay. Good. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great week, great two weeks. <laughs>